Today's episode of the Six Piece Podcast is going to be a guided reading of Chapter 2 from Rosalie Ham's novel, The Dressmaker. When it comes to our areas of comparison, we are going to focus on the idea of insular communities and conservative communities, as well as social hierarchy, truth, appearance, and deception. So what happens in this chapter? Well, we're first introduced to the Pratts, who are the general store owners, as well as the Beaumont family, who are more so upper class. A football match absorbs most of the town, and we are introduced to many characters whose arcs we follow throughout the text. But we notice that, uh, or we learn a little bit about characters who actually aren't at the football and some of their secrets. And many of the townspeople of Dungatar have secrets. They also um, discuss Tilly's return, many of the townspeople as well. So let's start our reading. On Saturday mornings, the main street of Dungatar sang to the chug of farm trucks and solid British automobiles, bearing smart pastoralist families. Younger children were passed into the care of older siblings and sent to the park so mothers could shop and gossip. Men stood in clumps, talking about the weather and looking to the sky, and thin-skinned, thick-boned women in floral sunfrocks and felt hats sat behind trestle tables selling raffle tickets. Here we have some great quotations for the gender roles of the villagers of Dungatar. Sergeant Ferret made his way past a young man slouched behind the wheel of a dusty Triumph Gloria and across the road towards Pratt's. He encountered Mona Beaumont on the footpath outside. Good morning, Mona, he called. I see you have your brother safely at home. Mother, sir, as... We can let the dreadful hide help go. That Mr. Max Swinney. Mona had a way of making words flat and long, so Sergeant Farrett always used, used his most melodious vowels when he spoke to her. Not too hasty, Mona. There's a fair chance William will be snapped up by one of our eligible spinsters before long. He smiled mischievously. You might find he's busy elsewhere. Mona shrank a little sideways, and picked at the pilling on her cardigan cuff. Mother says the girls around here are unrefined. Sergeant Farrett looked at Mona's tweed beret sitting on top of her head, like a dead cat, her posture laden and graceless. On the contrary, Mona, history has made us all independent. These are progressive times. It's an advantage to be adept, especially in the fairer sex. And Mona giggled at the sex word. Take, for example, the Pratt women. They know nuts and bolts and powders that are lethal to maggots in fly-struck merinos and stock feed in the treatment for chicken lice, haberdashery, fruit preservatives and female intimate apparel. Most employable. But mother says it's unrefined. Yes, I'm aware your mother considers herself very refined. And he is referring to Mrs. Beaumont, who we'll meet a little bit later on. Now, that section is really important just to talk about the setting and the time period, which Sergeant Farrett says is quite progressive. And he uses the Pratt women who own the general store to showcase their knowledge and how they're quite employable. And again, we're at a time where women are uh, joining the workforce in, in larger numbers, particularly following World War II. And we also get this sense of social hierarchy um, the working class and the upper class, and the difference here and how the working class, Sergeant Farrett um, says, is of much greater quality and requirement. He smiled, tipped his cap and entered the shop. Mona dragged a crumpled handkerchief from her cuff, held it to her open mouth and looked about perplexed. Alvin Pratt, his wife Muriel, daughter Gertrude and Reginald Blood the butcher worked cheerfully industrious behind their counters. Gertrude tended to groceries and dry goods. She tied every package with string, which she snapped with her bare fingers. A telling skill, the sergeant thought. Mrs Muriel Pratt was the expert in haberdashery and hardware. People whispered that she was more suited to hardware. And this is where we see again um, the idea that as, as a woman, she should be more so inclined to help with haberdashery, but hardware is um, where most people think she's better suited, the more masculine role. 
The small goods and butchery were in the far back corner of the shop where Reginald carved and sawed carcasses and forced mince into sheep intestine, then arranged his sausages neatly against circles of trimmed loin chops. Mr. Alvin Pratt had a courteous manner, but he was mean. He collected the account dockets from the counter three times a day and filed the debts alphabetically in his glass office. Customers usually turned their backs to him while Gertrude weighed up rolled loats or fetched Aspros because he would pull files from big wooden drawers and slowly turn the blue line plate pages while they waited. Sergeant Farrad approached Gertrude, large and sensitive in navy floral, ramrod straight behind her dry goods counter. Her mother, dull and blank, leaned on the counter beside her. Well, Gertrude, Mur- Muriel. Very well, thank you. Sergeant, off to see our footballers win their final this afternoon, I hope. There's a lot of work to finish up here before we can relax, Sergeant Farrett, said Gertrude. The sergeant held Gertrude's gaze a moment. Ah, Gertrude, he said, a good mule's load is always large. He turned to Muriel and smiled. If you'd oblige me with some blue checkered gingham and matching bias binding, I'm going to run up some bed bathroom curtains. They were used to the sergeant's bachelor ways. He'd often p- purchase materials for tablecloths and curtains. Muriel said he must have the fanciest linen in town. And again, we get some mentioning here of, of gender roles, not just Sergeant Farrett, um, but again, the idea when Sergeant Farrett talks about Gertrude, you know, a good mule's load is always large, that w- women are valued for their beauty more so than, than their work in this time. Now, at the haberdashery counter, Sergeant Farrett gazed at the button display while Muriel measured and ripped off five yards of gingham, which he took from her to fold, stretching it against his uniform, sniffing at starchy newness while Muriel spread wrapping paper on the counter. Gertrude looked down at her copy of Women's Illustrated Beneath the Counter. Draft your own cowgirl skirt, cried the cover, and a pretty girl twirled unfurling a gay blue and white check gingham skirt, cut on the cross with bias binding bows to garnish. She smiled a sly secret smile and watched Sergeant Farrett, a stout figure carrying a brand bundle under his arm, walk out the front door and across the street towards a triumph. Now the Beaumont's car was parked beside the park. Someone sat in the driver's seat. She stepped towards the door, but Alvin Pratt called from the rear of the shop, Gertrude, a customer at Chaff. So she walked between the shelves, beneath slow ceiling fans to the rear, where Miss Mona and Mrs. Elspeth Beaumont of Windswept Crest stood against the glare of back lane gravel. Mrs. Beaumont had heirs. She was a farmer's daughter who had married a well-to-do grazier's son. And although he wasn't as well-to-do as Elspeth imagined on her engagement, she was a small, sharp, razor-thin woman with a long nose and imperious expression. And the idea of her having a long nose is no mistake. She is quite nosy. She likes to know about other people's business. And she also sees herself as being of a higher social status and class as the other people in the village. She wore, as ever, a navy linen day dress and her fox fur. Circling her sun-spotched wedding finger was a tiny diamond cluster next to a thin gold band. Her daughter stood quietly beside her, wringing her handkerchief. Now Muriel, laconic and unkempt in her grubby apron, was speaking to Elspeth. Our Gert's a handsome, capable girl. When did you say Williams got back? Oh, said Gertrude and smiled. Williams back, is he? Mona spoke, yes, and he's... I'm waiting, snapped Mrs. Beaumont. Mrs. Beaumont needs chaff, love, said Muriel. Gertrude pictured her with a chaff bag hanging from her nose. Do you like oats mixed with your chaff, Mrs. Beaumont? Elspeth inhaled the dead fox around her shoulders rising. William's horse, she said, prefers plain chaff. I bet you're not not the only woman glad to see your son's back, said Muriel, and nudged her. Elspeth glanced sideways at the girl leaning over a bin, shoveling chaff into a hessian sack, and said loudly, William has a lot of hard work ahead of him at the property. Catching up will settle him, and then he can truly work towards our future. But the property won't be everything to William. He's travelled, mixed with society, very worldly these days. He'll need to look much further than here to find suitable companionship. And again, this idea of status. uh, Elspeth believes that William is far too good to marry anyone from Dungatar, that he will need to look 
probably more towards the city to find a wife. It also suggests a little bit about, um, again, the expectations within society that men and women, marriage is very, very important. And marriage, not just for love, but also for status too. Make sure you're marrying the right person to either increase your family's class um, or wealth even too. Now, Muriel nodded agreement. Gertrude stood next to the woman, women, the chaff against her knees. She leaned close to Elspeth and brushed at something on her shoulder. Fox fur floated. I thought something had caught on your poor old fox, Mrs. Beaumont. Chaff most likely, said Elspeth, and sniffed at the general store. No, Gertrude smiled innocently. innocently. I can see what it is. Looks like you need a box of naphthalene. Shall I fetch you one? And she reached again, pinched some moth-eaten fox fur, and let it float in front of them. The sharp eyes of the women circling Elspeth Beaumont focused on the bald patches of the mottled thinning pelt. Mrs. Beaumont opened her mouth to speak, but Muriel said dully, will charge the chaff as usual. William Beaumont Jr. had arrived back in Dungatar the night before, only hours before Tilly Dunnage. He'd been attending Agricultural College in Armadale, a small inland town. When William stepped from the train, his mother flung himself herself at him, squashed his cheeks between her palms and said, My son, you've come home to your future and your mother. He now sat waiting for her and his sister in the family car. The amalgamated Winyup Dungatai Gazette Argus crumpled in his lap. That's a newspaper. He stared down the main street of the hut on the hill, watching smoke curl from the chimney. The hut had been built long ago by a man who supposedly wanted to spot advancing bushrangers. He dropped dead soon after its completion, so the council acquired it and the surrounding land, then dug the tip of the base. When they sold the hill and dwelling, they sold it cheap. William fancied for a moment that it would be nice to live up there on top of the hill, detached but seeing everything. A really nice quotation to describe Tilly in her position in the, in the town. She's quite detached, but she can see them all. He sighed and turned east to the flat plains, to the cemetery in the farming country beyond the police station at the edge of the town, past the crumpling brick-rendered shop facades and warped weatherboards covering, covered in peeling paint. My future, muttered William determinately. I will make a life worth living here. And then self-doubt engulfed him, and he looked at his lap, his chin quivering. William definitely doesn't have the confidence here. Now the car door opened and William jumped. Mona, who was his sister, climbed lightly into the back seat. Mother says to come, she said. He drove to the back of Pratt's and while he was loading the chaff into the boot, a big girl standing in the huge doorway smiled at him. A grinning, expectant girl standing beside her plain mother against the backdrop of fishing rods and lines, lawnmowers, rope, car and tractor tyres, garden hoses and horse bridles, enamelled buckets and pitching forks in a haze of grain dust. As they drove away, Mona blew her nose and said, Every time we come to town, I get hay fever. It doesn't agree with me either, said Elspeth, looking out at the townsfolk. Again, she sees herself as far more superior. The women from the street stall, the shoppers and proprietors were gathered in clumps on the footpath to look up at the hill. Who lives at Mad Molly's now, said William. Mad Molly, said Elspeth, unless she's dead. Someone's alive. They lit her fire, he said. Elspeth swung around and glared out the rear window. Stop, she cried. Sergeant Farrett paused outside the Shire office to peer up at the hill, then turned to look down the street. And now we're going to be introduced to some of the town's people, some of the many characters who will trace and track along the journey of this text. Nancy Pickett leaned on her worn broom outside the chemist shop while Fred and Pearl Bundle wandered down from the pub to join sisters Ruth and Prudence Dim outside the post office building. In his office above, Councilman Evan Pettyman picked up his coffee cup and swung his leather shire president's chair to gaze out the window. He jumped, spilling his coffee, and swore. In the back streets, Beulah Harradine ran between the housewives standing on their nature strips in brunch coats and curlers. She's back, she hissed. Myrtle Dunnage has come back. At the tip, May McSweeney watched her son Teddy standing in the backyard looking up at the slim girl in trousers on the veranda, her hair lifting in the breeze. May crossed her arms and frowned. So here we can see the many reactions of the townspeople when they notice that Tilly 
or Myrtle, as she's also known as, is back. So we have Sergeant Farrett, who looks up um, at Nancy Pickett, who's looking up at the hill. Um, we've got Elspeth, who stops when she, when she finds out that someone's alive and living up there. Um, we've also got the councilman, Evan Pettyman, who spills his coffee and swears when he notices. And Beulah Haradine, who is one of the town's biggest gossipers, is quick to tell everyone that Myrtle Dunnage has come back. Even Mae McSweeney crosses her arms and frowns when she realised that Tilly is back. And we get a sense or an idea that the townspeople blame Tilly for something that happened in the past. And this plays a really important role throughout not only the character's development, but also Tilly and how she exacts revenge on the town. That afternoon, Sergeant Farrett stood at the table concentrating his tongue earnestly searching for the tip of his nose. He ran a discerning thumb across the sharp peaks of his pinking shears, then crunched them through the gingham. As a child, little Horatio Farrett had lived with his mother in Melbourne above a milliner's shop. When he'd grown up, he joined the police force, and just after the graduation ceremony, Horatio approached his superiors with drawings and patterns. He designed new police uniforms. Already we've seen and we've heard this, a number of these um, events from the text have come from Sergeant Farrett's perspective that he's really interested in, in fashion. And as we find out later on, he's very into designing his own clothes and wearing dresses as well, which again goes against the gender roles of the time. Now Constable Farrett was immediately posted to Dangata, where he found extremes in the weather and peace and quiet. The locals were pleased to find the new officer was also a justice of the peace and, unlike their former sergeant, didn't join the football club or insist on free beer. The sergeant was able to design and make his own clothes and hats to match the weather. The outfits didn't necessarily complement his physique, but they were unique. He was able to enjoy their effect fully during his annual leave, but in Dangata, he wore them only inside the house. Again, he needs to maintain his... his or needs to be conservative within the town that's outside the town or in the privacy of his own home where he feels like he's able to be himself. The sergeant liked to take his holidays in spring, spending two weeks in Melbourne shopping, enjoying the fashion shows at Myers and David Jones and attending the theatre, but it was always lovely to get home. His garden suffered without him and he loved his town, his home, his office. He settled at his singer. The singer is a brand of sewing machine pumping the treadle with stock, stockinged feet and guided the skirt seams beneath the pounding needle. Tooting car horns and a rousing cheer floated from the football oval where young men stood in the grandstand drinking beer. Men in hats and grey overcoats gathered near the sh dressing sheds, barracking, and today their wives had abandoned their knitting to watch every move the teams made. Football is a really central part of the town's culture. Whenever the team's playing, everyone stops to go and watch them. In the deserted refreshment shed, the pies burned to a cinder in the warming oven and kids squatted behind the hot dog boiler, picking up icing from the tops of the patty cakes. The crowd barked and the horns blasted again. Dangata was winning. Down at the station hotel, Fred Bundle also caught the sounds floating through the grey afternoon and fetched more stools from the beer garden. Once Fred's body had been alcohol pickled and his skin the texture of a sodden bark cloth. The one day he'd been serving behind the bar and had opened the trap door intending to tap another keg. He'd reached the torch, stepped back and vanished. He'd fallen into the cellar, a ten-foot plummet into brick. He tapped the keg, finished his shift, then closed up as usual. When he didn't come down for bacon and eggs the next morning, Pearl went up. She pulled back the blankets and saw her ex-rover's legs were purple and swollen to the size of gum tree trunks. The doctor said he had broken both femurs in two places and Fred Bundle was a teetotaler these days. Teetotaler means someone who doesn't drink. Oh, alcohol, that is. Now, out in the kitchen, Pearl hummed and rinsed lettuce, sliced tomatoes and buttered bread of high, of white high, high top for sandwiches. As a hostess and publican's wife, Pearl believed it was essential to be attractive. She set her bottle blonde hair every night and painted her fingernails and lips red and wore matching hair ribbons. She favoured pedal pushes and stiletto skips with plastic flowers. Drunks removed their hats in her presence, and farmers brought her fresh-skinned rabbits or homegrown marrows. The ordinary women of Dungatar curled their top lips and sneered. 
You do your own hair, don't you, Pearl? I don't mind mind paying for a decent set myself. A little bit of the jealousy is clearly present. And as Fred says, they're just jealous, he would say, pinching his wife's bottom. So Pearl stood in front of her dressing table mirror every morning, smiled at her blonde and crimson reflection and said, jealousy is a curse and ugliness is worse. The final siren bled and the rising club song carried from the oval. Fred and Pearl embraced behind the bar and Sergeant Farrett paused to say, hooray. The siren did not reach Mr. Almanac in his chemist shop. He was absorbed, shuffling through photo packages newly arrived from the developing lab in Winyup. He studied the black and white images under the light from his open refrigerator, which held many secrets. Crooks, halibut oil, pastes, coloured pills inside cotton mouth jars, creams, nostrums, and purgatives, emetics, glomerulous inhibitors, potions for nooks and creases, galley pots, insecticidal oils for vermin-infested hair, stained glass jars, and carboys containing fungi for female cycles or essence of animal for masculine irritations, tin oxide for boils, carbuncles, acne, styes, poultices and tubes for weeping, sinus, chloroforms and salts, ointments and salines, minerals and dyes, stones, waxes and abrasives, anti-venom and deadly oxidants, milk of magnesius and acids to eat cancers, blades and needles and soluble thread, herbs and abortifs... I'm not going to say that word. Anti-hemetics and anti-pyrotics, resins and earplugs, lubricants and devices to remove accidental objects from orifices. That is a very, very long sentence. That's all that he keeps though. So this is... I guess, a way of showing that there are many problems that the townspeople have and he has all the ways of getting rid of their imperfections or any secrets that, that, that they have. He's got everything. So in essence, he's the town's secret keeper based on what he has as a pharmacist. Now, Mr. Almanac tended the townspeople with the contents of his refrigerator and only Mr. Almanac knew what you needed and why because the nearest doctor was 30 miles away, getting quite an inch of town. He was examining the square grey and white snapshots belonging to Faith O'Brien. Faith standing, smiling with her husband Hamish in the railway station. Faith O'Brien reclining on the blanket next to Reginald Blood's black Ford prefect, her blouse unbuttoned, her skin kicked up and her slip showing. So back in the day, you used to get your photos developed at a chemist and Mr. Almanac gets them developed, these photos developed, and one of them is of Faith O'Brien, one with her husband, but one with another man where she's showing a lot of skin. As we know, this is a very conservative community. That is a massive, massive no-no. And we might even make a connection there with The Crucible where we saw some adulterous behavior through the characters, namely of John Proctor and Abigail. Now, Mr. Almanac growled, sinners, he said, sliding the photographs back into the blue and white envelope. He reached a stiff, crooked arm to the back of the refrigerator to a jar of white paste. Faith had been in, whispering to Mr. Almanac that she had an itch down there, and now he knew her lusty husband wasn't the cause of her discomfort. Mr. Almanac unscrewed the lid and sniffed, then reached for the open tin of white lily abrasive cleaner on the sink at his elbow. He scooped some into his fingers, then plunged them into the potion and stirred, screwing the lid back on and put the jar at the front of the top shelf. We notice him being quite vengeful here. Faith O'Brien obviously has uh, a very nasty rash. I'll quote down there. Um, And he puts some abrasive cleaner into cream, which is meant to obviously help it. Um, But we know he is definitely against her behavior in cheating on her husband on being with Reginald Blood so he's going to make her pay now he closed the door reached with both arms to the edge of the fridge and grabbed it with a small grunt the stiff old man pulled his stooped torso faintly to the left and then the right and gathering momentum rocked his rigid body until one foot rose the other followed and Mr. Almanac turned and tripped across his dispensary halting only when he bumped against the shop's counter all the counters and shelves in Mr. Almanac's chemist shop were bare. Everything on view was either in wire strengthened glass cases or on high sided benches, like billiard tables, 
so that nothing could fall and break when Mr. Almanac bumped to a halt against them. Advancing Parkinson's disease had left him, a cur- had left him curved, a mumbling question mark, forever face down, tumbling short-stepped through his shop and across the road to his low, damp home. So he, obviously he has um, some physical issues, which means he can't walk properly. Collision was his friend and saviour when his assistant Nancy was absent from the shop and his customers were used to greeting only the top of his balding head, standing behind his ornate and musical copper-plated cash register. As his disease advanced, so had his anger over the state of Dungatar's footpaths and he'd written to Mr. Evie Pederman, the shy president. Mr. Almanac waited, stuck and called against the shop counter until Nancy came. You who I'm here, boss. She gently guided him by the elbow to the front door, pushed his hat tightly onto his belt, bent head, and wound his scarf against his neck, tying a knot at the nape to sit where his head used to belong. She curled over in front of him and looked up into his face. Close game today, boss. Only beat him by eight goals too. They'd be a few minor injuries, I'd say, but I told him you got gallons of liniment and crepe bandage. She patted the arched cervical vertebrae pushing on his white coat and shuffled with him to the curb. Mrs. Almanac sat in her wheelchair in the front gate opposite. A quick glance up and down the street and Nancy gave her boss a shove and he chugged straight over the rise in the middle of the bitumen and down to Mrs. Almanac who held the cushion out at arm's length. Mr. Almanac's hat came to a soft halt deep in the cushion and he was safely home. So he has to cross the road to get from work back to his home. Now out at windswept crest, Elspeth Beaumont stood at her agar in her homestead kitchen, lovingly basting a roasting pork joint. Her son loved the crackle. William Beaumont Jr. was at the Oval, laughing with the men in the change rooms, standing in the steamy air with naked blokes and the smell of sweat and stale socks, palm olive soap and liniment. He felt easy, bold and confident among the soft, ugly intimacy of the grass-stuck, grazed knees the songs, the profanity. And again, the football club, very much that blue-collar, working-class sort of environment, but William feels more at home there than at his family's property. Now, Scotty Pullet was smiling next to William, sipping from a tin flask, springing on the balls of his feet. Scotty was fragile and crimson with a bulbous blue-tipped nose and a wet, boiling cough from smoking a packet of capstans a day. He'd failed both as a husband and a jockey, but had stumbled on success and popularity when he stilled some excellent watermelon firewater or alcohol. He still was set up at a secret location on the creek bank. He drank most of it, but sold some or gave it to Pearl for food, rent and cigarettes. And how about the first goal of the third quarter? Had it in the bag for a certain then, mate. Just a question of waiting for the siren. All, o- all over bar the shouting. He laughed, then coughed until he turned purple. Fred Bundle snapped the top of the bottle with a barman's finesse and tilted its mouth to the glass, black liquid pouring thickly. He placed the glass on the bar in front of Hamish O'Brien and picked through the coin sitting wetly on the bar cloth. Hamish stared at his Guinness, waiting for the froth to settle. The first wave of football revellers neared, singing down the street, then tumbling into the bar, trailing chilled air and victory, the room now full of roaring. My boys, cried Pearl, and spread her arms to them, her face alive with smiles. A young man's profile caught her eye, and most did, but this was a face from her past, and Fred had helped her bury her past. She stood, arms spread, watching the young man drink his beer glass, drink from his beer glass, I should say, the footballers singing and jostling about her. He turned to look at her, a smudge of foam sitting on his nose. Pearl felt her pelvic floor contract, and she steadied herself against the bar. Her eyebrows For crumpled together and her mouth Sips creased Peace down. Podcast. Bill, she said, Spotify, and Fred was Apple beside her then. And William resembles his father Remember, rather than his mother. Wouldn't you say, Pearl? He cupped her elbow. It's William, said the young man, and wiped the foam from his nose. Not a ghost. He smiled his father's smile. Teddy McSweeney arrived at the bar beside him. Is there a ghost of a chance we'll get a beer, Pearl? And Pearl drew in a long, unthe- unsteady breath. Teddy, our prices full forward. Did you win for us today? Teddy launched into, into the club song. William joined him and the crowd sang again. Pearl kept a close eye on young William, who laughed readily and shouted drinks when it wasn't his turn, trying to fit in. 
and Fred kept a close eye on his Pearly. We get this idea that something happened between Pearl and William's father. And William, again, is really trying to fit in here. Now, from the end of the bar, Sergeant Farrett caught Fred's eye and pointed to his watch. It was well after 6 p.m. And at this time in the 1950s, not just in country towns, but even in Melbourne um, and Sydney, the main cities, um, bars would close at 6 p.m. Now, Fred gave the sergeant the thumb up, thumbs up. Pearl caught the sergeant at the door and he paused and put his cap on. That young myrtle Dunninger's back, I see. The sergeant nodded and turned to go. Surely she's not staying. I don't know, he said. Then it was gone and the footballers were, f- were fastening masonite covers to the glass door and windows. Night air raid covers left over from the wall. Pearl went back to the bar and poured a p- fat, foamy pot of beer, placed it neatly in front of William and smiled lovingly, lovingly at him. Another hint there. At his car, Sergeant Farrett looked back at the pub, standing like an electric wireless in the mist light peeping around the edges of the blackouts and the sound of sportsmen, winners and drinkers inside. Now the district inspector was unlikely to pass through. Sergeant Farrett cruised, his wiper smearing dew across the windscreen, first down to the creek to check Scotty Still for thieves, then over the railway line towards the cemetery. Reginald Blood's Ford Prefect was there, steamy windowed and rocking softly behind the headstone. Inside the car... Reginald looked up and up over Faith O'Brien's large breasts and said, You are a fine-grained and tender creature, Faith. And he kissed the soft beige areola around her hard nipple while her husband Hamish sat at the bar of the station hotel, sucking on the beige foam of his pint of Guinness. And another secret here we have, obviously, is Faith O'Brien having an affair with Reginald Blood. And we note that there have been a couple of hints to affairs throughout this text already. And that is the end of chapter two, which gives us a really clear view of what the town is like. And to finish off, let's look at some key quotations. Again, to describe the town, the idea that mothers could shop and gossip, and men stood in clumps talking about the weather and looking at the sky to show those gender roles. How women, their job is sort of to, to, to talk and, and spread rumours, and men more so talking about the boring stuff like, like the weather. To describe William Beaumont, from Elspeth Beaumont's point of view, he's travelled, mixed with society, very worldly these days. He'll need to look much further than here to find companionship, she says, about her son. And the last one, Mr Almanac and his nosy ways. He studied the black and white images under the light from his open refrigerator, which held many secrets. Sinners, he said. And there he, of course, is talking about Faith O'Brien and Reginald Blood. And that is our guided reading of chapter 2 of The Dressmaker.